I think the key is really trying to identify first principles of how things work um, and so that you can apply them to the problem that you're trying to solve. And um, in my case, it's trying to help people recover their health or help me recover my health um, or to understand if something's likely to be helpful or not. And so, um, so yeah, so in terms of, you know, first principles or things that are just going to always be accurate. Hey, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint podcast. With me today is Dr. Mel Hopper Koppelman, who is somebody I really just sort of stumbled across. Uh, we became Facebook friends. I'm not even sure how. And I started reading her posts out of the blue and uh, became really fascinated and impressed with some of her thinking about health and uh, kept reading more and more of her stuff and uh, and continued to be very impressed by her uh, original and, and very novel way of thinking about health. Um, she has a background in all kinds of things from nutrition to uh, functional medicine, to traditional Chinese medicine, to functional developmental behavioral neuroimmunology and many, many other fields. She's really a very, very widely read um, student geek of health science and she knows a lot about a whole lot of dimensions of health science and what really most excites me is she's somebody who thinks about health in novel ways is really trying to put together different models different different uh, scientific evidence and research and piece together uh, new insights and ways of understanding and approaching health and attacking health problems um, so with no further ado, I'm very excited to share this conversation, part one of what will be a multi-part discussion with Dr. Mel Hopper Koppelman. Enjoy. Mel, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So I don't know how we uh, connected on Facebook, but somehow we did um, maybe six months or a year ago or something like that. And in my feed i started seeing posts from yours and i think i saw one and i read it which is not common for me because i don't really spend much time on facebook i read it and i was very intrigued and impressed by some of the things that you were saying um your perspectives more than anything to me struck me as novel you struck me as an original thinker who was thinking outside the box who wasn't just another one of the typical sort of run of the mill natural health or functional medicine types that was uh, regurgitating whatever the latest thing you learned at from your certification or the latest seminar or something like that from someone else, but you were really involved in thinking originally and coming up with your own ideas and developing your own paradigm. And, uh, and I saw more of your posts and I saw more of the same and more of the same and more of the same. And I've come to really respect and admire a lot of the, the perspectives that you have. And I do this podcast, I think 50-50 in part because I want to share your knowledge with my audience. And the other 50% is my own personal curiosity, wanting to explore your paradigms more deeply myself because they're of interest to me. And, uh, and I like the way you think. And I, in general, I like the people who are trying to think in original ways, you know? So um, with that said, here we are. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I've been a long time uh, viewer of your podcast. And so it's very exciting for me to be here. Awesome, awesome. So um, let's start at the meta level. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan, as I think you are, of paradigm and understanding the importance of, of paradigm as the key thing that will determine how we understand a particular problem or how we understand health and longevity and energy and things of that nature more broadly and based on how we understand the nature of those things what we are inclined to do to build health or to solve health problems so with with that said um and i know this is a difficult ask because you'd like to go deep but can you give our audience a sort of relatively succinct high level sort of meta level summary of your your big picture view paradigm of health uh sure i can try um i think the key is really trying to identify first principles of how things work 
um, and so that you can apply them to the problem that you're trying to solve. And um, in my case, it's trying to help people recover their health or help me recover my health um, or to understand if something's likely to be helpful or not. And so, um, so yeah, so in terms of, you know, first principles or things that are just going to always be accurate. And what I've found is that, you know, throughout my journey, my professional journey, my health journey, I was able to find some really great ideas and maybe they were um, more helpful than the status quo. But when I would bump up against areas where they weren't working, you know, and say, well, what about this exception? Or what about this person? Or what about then? It was hard to find answers. And so um, it required me to find kind of bigger and bigger maps or different maps and figure out how to put them together. So, um, you know, first principles thinking, which I think is fairly in vogue now, um, it just means that it's the underlying uh kind of basis of how things work it tends to be quite simple it tends to be true whether you rec you know you're, you're aware of them or not um and it it helps you kind of describe the context of what you're trying to do so when something's going to work and when it's not okay and and what are first principles maybe for people who uh, are, are unfamiliar with that term uh yeah it's sort of the kind of the simplest basis of understanding something, whether it's um, a person or a machine or a problem that when you kind of, we, we might start off with the details or we might start off with what we can see. And, and that's an example. Um, but when you kind of keep zooming out and you keep uh, asking questions, the first principles are going to be like, this is how it always works, you know, and these are, um, and if you find an exception, then you might need to kind of rethink what you thought you understood about that system. So to give you some kind of concrete examples, because um, I think a lot of confusion in health comes from us um, being really kind of focused on the microscopic, right? Which is not really where the first principles live. Like the microscopic exists and it can be helpful sometimes, um, but the first principles kind of exist really where things, the things that we can see, like, um, you know, to be honest, uh, one field that provides a lot of like really helpful understanding and information is looking at things ecologically, ecology. So um, with ecology, you'd be thinking about temperature, for example, is is something hot or cold? Is something dry or moist? You know, um, is something kind of bright or dark? Really, really simple. Um, but that gives you a lot of really useful big picture information. And that and those things are always going to be relevant and true, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, life evolved on Earth on a sunny planet with water and soil. <laughs> so we're kind of getting, again, at some first principles. And those things are always going to be true. Um, and they're always going to be relevant. And so, you know, one thing I found when I got very stuck in the weeds of biochemical pathways um, is that if you can't bring back what you're looking at to kind of those things I just mentioned, like, you know, light and temperature and soil, you might not understand it as well as you hope. Uh, I absolutely love the last part of what you just said there. Um, something that's a thought I don't think I've ever heard anyone else express, but it's something that I've really zeroed in on, uh, especially in my, my recent writing for my upcoming book as being of central importance. I would pretty much classify all, and I don't want to be mean here or sound like I'm uh, opposed to conventional medicine or something like that because I'm very appreciative of many aspects of conventional medicine, emergency medicine and, and um, antimicrobial drugs and things like that um, and, and many other areas. However, I, I would put most of conventional medical thinking and the conventional medical approach to chronic disease in the category of what you just described there as, mm -hmm. as, as being fixated on in, in the weeds of biochemistry and not linking it back to some of these first principles. Um, for example, I mean, the conventional medical paradigm isn't grounded in a paradigm of evolutionary biology and evolutionary health, right. which is not just a small flaw, it is a, a, a fundamental flaw. In my view, you cannot understand health without looking at it through an evolutionary lens. Um, and I think that has to, a lot to do with those first principles you're, you're describing. But I also think that there's a huge amount of people in natural health and functional medicine circles who are also in the weeds of biochemical pathways who are not linking it back to first principles. 
I, I would agree with that. And I definitely myself made the same error, you know, for many years. That's how, kind of how I've um, ended up where I am because it can be fun to study those pathways and it's interesting and it's not irrelevant and there's kind of a, a fun trail there. Um, but I think part of it is that when we get into lab testing, we're getting into quantification and that gives us a certain level of certainty and we all have a need for certainty. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can, you know, calm fears and it can make us feel confident. And especially as a clinician, you know, you're trying to do the best for your patients and in people, you know, especially with complex chronic illness, they've got layers of things going on. They've got mixes of patterns, you know, it, it's, it's, it's confusing. And so if you can use numbers, it feels like it's grounding. It gives you this, wow. I would say an illusion um, of, of grounding where you can point to something with certainty. Um, the problem is because it's, it is really divorced from the first principles, it's a false sense of certainty um, and it's not grounded. It's actually very disembodied. And, you know, another, I think kind of thread of what you were saying about how, um, you know, mainstream medicine is very, and, and a lot of, you know, functional medicine and integrative medicine, I think is maybe a little too over enamored, um, with lab tests is that, um, not only uh, is it completely divorced from an understanding of evolutionary biology, but part of the, part of the fundamental premise is that they intentionally remove context in studying it. So evolutionary biology is like, let's say, the meta context, it's like the, the key context and um, the you know, a, a double blind placebo controlled randomized trial is coming from a worldview where we are stripping away context in order to study something, even though context actually provides most of the impact of what you were what you were studying. Mm. Right. So it's it's almost like a, a mental health problem in the research literature at large, you know, that is like kind of not, you know, most people aren't aware of. They just kind of go in and they read, not realizing that this is you know, based on some like pretty big flaws before we sat down to do our research. Yeah, I love the way you just explained that. Um, let's let's explore this lab testing thing more deeply. Um, yeah. because I, I, I feel like it's an area where so few people really understand what you were just alluding to there, um, both within the general population and I think among practitioners. I think that there are huge numbers of practitioners as well as the general public who have been indoctrinated into the idea that when we use these tests, when we look at a blood panel, a comprehensive blood panel, a uh, comprehensive hormone panel and, um, you know, organic acids tests and microbiome tests and um, what, whatever other kind of tests you want to run, uh, food allergen tests and so on, uh, food intolerance tests, um, that we are getting a really, really comprehensive view of um, human health and what's going on in the body that all of this data, like what, I think we imagine that we are looking at the totality of what, what can be measured in the body. And we have this really complete picture uh, of, of all the physiology that, and biochemistry that's happening inside that body. And I think what's become more and more apparent to me is two dimensions. One is that many of these tests are actually highly inaccurate. And you and I have had previous mm -hmm. discussions. For example, I shared some of my microbiome tests with you yeah. from three different companies, and you could see mass disparities <laughs> yeah. from literally the same fecal sample yeah. um, in what these different tests were saying was present in my microbiome or not present in my microbiome. I mean, massive differences. Yeah. Um, so, which tells you, okay, well, what does any of this data mean? How do I know I can trust any of this data or any of it is, is giving me any sort of legitimate information? Whereas if you only looked at one of those tests, your brain would be inclined to think, well, this is exactly what's going on in my microbiome. Yeah. And you wouldn't have those two other sets of data to make you go, oh, I wonder if that first test was actually totally inaccurate and none of that stuff should be trusted. Um, that's one dimension is realizing uh, how widespread there, uh, the issue of inaccuracy and lack of repeatability of these tests are. And the second dimension is realizing that there's so, so, so much more 
going on in the body than even what these tests are mentioning. And it's like, I, I don't even, I'm trying to think of the proper analogy to express this, but like, imagine you had a giant, let's say mountain, you know, covered in trees, covered in a forest and you had a spotlight and it was at night and you had a spotlight on just the bottom right section of this and you saw a group of 10 or 15 trees and you were like okay now we understand everything that's present here but you were missing 90 percent of the mountain that's there and you were convinced that this little piece of the forest was the entirety of of what's there you know that that's kind of what i feel like is going on but what, what's your take on this oh boy um you're touching on a subject that's very close to my heart and again this is coming from you know very hard won personal experience of doing lots of lab testing doing lots of study um you know i did a, kind of a six month internship on one lab that was a metabolomics lab that's 200 markers and we were just focused on that and 90 percent of the information or the interpretation is not even written on the report and then i'm going off onto pubmed so believe me when i say it's you know there are layers and layers and layers of false assumptions that lab testing is based on um, and once you start to see them, because they're not, it's not that tricky, you know, I can explain a, a, quite a few of them. Then you start to shrug your shoulders and go, what's the point? And, um, and just to kind of say, I haven't completely abandoned lab testing, but I mean, it's just not the cornerstone of my practice anymore. And they need to be used with an abundance of caution. Um, yeah. so and they're not, you, and they're not being used with an abundance. They, of they are not, I, no, they're you being yeah. used with this uh, sense of certainty. And, yes. you know, I want to make sure that I say that the antidote to that is being able to learn how to see with your eyes better, you know, because a lot of people don't have uh, a better alternative, you know, that if they're coming to functional medicine from, let's say, mainstream medicine, then that's maybe even a step in the right direction. If they're coming to functional medicine from other clinical areas where they haven't been taught how to gather tons of information by kind of looking and smelling and listening and all of those things, then they're kind of flying blind a little bit and, and the lab testing is what they have. But let me give you some examples to illustrate, you know, some of the problems. So um, one comes from this really great uh, paper. It was written by the Sci European Scientific Committee, I think around 2015, but there was this group that was put together to basically answer the question for the European government, are dental amalgams safe? Um, mercury fillings, right? And this s committee of scientific experts concluded that they absolutely were not <laughs> safe. Um, the European government completely ignored them and continued to recommend them. So this group published this position paper that really everyone should have a copy of because it's written really well. And they summarized the data. And one of the things that they say is that not only is body burden of mercury and the way you determine body burden burden of mercury is on autopsy. <laughs> you have a dead person and you have to, that's the way to measure mercury in a person. So obviously we don't want to do that for our patients or for ourselves, but um, so body burden is like linearly correlated with the number of amalgams that you have and the length of time you've had them. But body burden of mercury um, is not at all correlated with blood levels of mercury, hair levels of mercury, or urine. There's no relationship which is like, you know, absolutely mind blowing. I, you know, I run mercury tests in, in my, my clinic. I, I tend to run a tri test where you're taking samples from blood and urine and hair. And, you know, and this is the most accurate test on the planet. I still believe it aside from autopsy, of course, it is the most accurate and it's not. Why don't you just what, take it on autopsy? I know. I know it's, it's a tough sell. I was having <laughs> most accurate way. Just do that. I, I'm, I'm like most accurate way. I was having trouble with the marketing <laughs> <laughs> and then repeat custom. Um, you know, so it, basically it's not, there's no relationship between the amount in the blood in, in the blood and in your brain and kidneys and bones, which is where it's ending up. And, and that's, that's not a small point, you know, that's, that's a big point. And so what it's telling us is that what's happening in the blood is not always or always often. I don't know. We, not enough people are asking this question. What is the relationship between what is in the blood and what is in the body? We maybe don't know the answer to that. You know, another example is that there's uh, an inverse correlation between the amount of calcium in your hair and the amount of calcium in your arteries, mm. right? So direct inverse relationship. So um, that's not a small problem. Another not so small problem is where reference ranges come from, right? So um, in 
you know, conventional industrial medicine, um, reference ranges will tend to be um, where 95% of the population falls. That population is the population of a specific lab. So just like with your poo being sent off to different labs, if you send your blood off to different labs, um, they should be coming up with the same numbers, um, ideally, but how they classify that, whether that's normal or high or low is actually going to be very different. So that's going to determine if, you know, whether or not you end up on medication, that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of crazy. And then what I've found over the years is that functional medicine's answer to that is to just tend to use more narrow ranges, you know? So they're basically like, oh, this 95% thing's too big. Let's just go here. But from my perspective, that's not evidence-based either. Yeah. And really the, you know, if we're going to try to do this, then what I propose is that we should be using um, very large samples, you know, studies based on large samples that are calculating usually all-cause mortality um, and see where the risk is lowest. And those exist for a number of markers. And what you find is that it doesn't correspond to the, the industrial medicine range and it doesn't really correspond to the functional medicine range. Um, and to add another layer is that for most markers, they really should be different for men and women. And that's also not a small point, you know, um, cause, cause it's, well, because it's not. So basically if we're not understanding where it should be, then we can't really say if it's good or not, if we're being, if we're not accurate there. So that's, uh, another problem, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think what you said about some of these, looking at the, the relationship between some of these markers and mortality, it's also become apparent to me that so many of the markers that are being looked at don't even have any data as it pertains to mortality. And yet they're being portrayed with this kind of grand sense of importance, like, oh yeah, like we, we have, there, there's an assumption built in, in other words, that just because you ran a test and you got back some data and you found some abnormality, that that abnormality must be really important and must be in, 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 in some way um, related to maybe your symptoms. Um, yeah. Whereas I, I think the reality is if we were able to, going back to that analogy that I gave, if we were able to measure all of that mountain, we would probably find if, if there's one abnormality present, if we measured lots more stuff, if we have the capability to, like let's say yeah. the, the more next generation of testing with metabolomics testing, we'd probably find dozens of abnormalities in many different systems of the body. 100%. And really what we're finding is that um, you know, our understanding of cellular biology is changing based on metabolomics and that, um, you know, I know that you're a big fan of Bob Navio's work, as am I. He's, you know, great, great thing. He has an encyclopedic knowledge of, of you know, metabolomics, of uh, pathways, of genetics and, and all sorts of things. Um, and so what you, what you find is that you get these global changes. So metabolomics yeah. is a way of kind of measuring changes of everything at the same time. But what's really interesting and exciting is that when you look at that, what you're seeing is actually, wait for it, the changes in hot and cold, mm -hmm. winter and summer. And, you know, so there's an increasing amount of metabolomic studies being done on, for example, Chinese herbs, which are classified by temperature amongst other things. And when you look at hot herbs, they increase summer metabolism. And if you look at hot patterns, it, usually in mice, it's the same thing. And if you look at cold patterns, it's, it's, it's the reverse. And so they, you know, they were zoomed in on these individual markers. You know, maybe they, you know, people were running dozens or hundreds. Well, we've got like 20,000 proteins, you know? Um, then people are looking at metabolomics. Like, you know, I was looking at an ion panel with 200 markers thinking if I just keep looking at this, I'll know exactly what to give a patient. And, and I'm looking at like fatty acid pathways and I'm looking at amino, I'm like driving myself crazy. Yeah. I'm like, okay, you, you have a, you're missing this cofactor and this is happening. Um, and there isn't an understanding of really, the bigger picture is that the cell danger response is an exaggerated summer metabolism. Let me, Mel, can we, before we get into summer and winter metabolism, which I think will require some greater uh, explanation to our audience for people to get where you're going with that. Let's jump back one step to just this, this thing you were just alluding to with going down these, this, this vast complexity of analyzing these, these biochemical pathways. I, I personally feel like that 
pursuit is endless. The, the level of complexity is endless. And we are like every day, there's, there's more layers to that story emerging. Yeah. And I feel like it's in a legitimately impossible task for any human to really master the, that level of, of in-depth biochemistry of so many different mechanisms. But more importantly, what, what I've found in doing the kind of thing that you were just describing is like analyzing this and that pathway, and then, okay, based on this understanding, it's a quick digression. Lot, when you actually delve into this on a, in a very detailed level, especially some of the more emerging pathways and things like that, you realize that there's conflicting views. Like there's different studies that find different things and not every study is even showing the same consistent finding. But let's ignore that aspect of things. Let's just say we have clarity on all the, the, this complicated biochemistry. And we start thinking along the lines, which is really sort of a, an allopathic way of thinking, um, that when we understand things at the most micro level possible, here's this biochemical mechanism, here's the dysfunction present in it, um, that when we can intervene on that micro level of biochemistry of, oh, this pathway must be dysfunctioning. So if only we add this chemical, this synthetic chemical or this natural chemical, either a drug or a supplement, let's say, um, that it will change the biochemistry of this pathway and alter and, and fix the dysfunction that's present. I, I, have, I have explored that in such great depth over such a long time, and I have found it so lacking, so ineffective, so like that th there is no, um, there is almost no correlation between the degree of bio of, of in-depth biochemistry knowledge that a person has and the level of results of how much they can help you improve your health. And if anything, there might be, if we include conventional medicine in the mix, there might be an inverse correlation. I would say probably an inverse correlation. I think, I think what's important to remember is that there are genetic diseases. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are inborn errors of metabolism. There yeah. are genetic diseases where you have a single point mutation, where you have a, um, a typo in the genetic code, and that leads to an illness you can see with your eyes. So that's um, bottom-up causation. The problem is, is that just because that exists doesn't mean that's usually the case. And actually, that's like the rare, rare exception. But that's, right. that's the thinking that's being applied to every everything you know or to exactly. everyone and so this is the problem that people need to remember it's not that it's never true yeah. it's that it's sometimes true but all but usually not you know yes and and just to put numbers on that to make it even more concrete um it's less than one percent of illness right. that that are true genetic illnesses yeah. and over 80 percent of the chronic disease burden are diseases of nutrition and lifestyle exactly exactly that so just so people have that kind of context and awareness is that you know i think what's what kind of the bigger meta problems in modern times is that when that people are not um it, it's tricky to know when something is true it, people want to know if it's true mm -hmm. and things are usually true sometimes right yeah. so it's not that people are wrong it's just more about understanding the context right you know so let so i agree with with that and thank you for adding that let's say in and, and this is generally the assumption that i'm talking about is that we're talking about the 80 80 percent plus right. of the chronic disease burden that are generally caused by lifestyle factors um, within that which are the major killers things like heart disease and cancer and dementia and obesity and diabetes and so on um, and and many more um, even things like sarcopenia and frailty and death by accident are largely mm -hmm. related to this um, within that i i find specifically that the pursuit of trying to correct dysfunctional biochemical pathways is highly ineffective. Yeah. C completely agree. And, it, and like you say, it's, it, it may have no correlation with outcomes and it may have an inver inverse correlation with outcomes. And it's really a matter of being too zoomed in on, you know, on a, on a pine needle on that tree in that corner that you were looking at. And, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that I, knows because I can, I, you know, in my studies, I continue to see what's being taught in functional medicine. And part of my, my journey, um, 
you know, after I studied Chinese medicine, I knew I wanted to do an internal medicine and I kind of nerdy and into you know, biochemistry. And my mom was a medical doctor and a medical researcher. And my dad, my grandfather was a chemist and his brother was a chemist, at, you know, a top chemist at Yale and, and all this. So I kind of wanted to do that. Um, and part of my course correction and going down that path and kind of seeing that there's no there there <laughs> um, is, is then swinging back to, um, you know, what I was kind of talking about before about ecology, you know, and the kind of the metaphor I use is like, you know, I'm not a gardener yet. I, I want to become a gardener, but I, it, I'm not a gardener. But I know that when gardeners look at land, they are able to get a lot of information just by looking, right? That we're like, oh, how do you know that? Are you a witch? It's like, well, no, I I can just see, right? Whereas me, I I, I can't do that. Um, and so, you know, if, we, if we're not using that power of just observation and common sense and our ability to see with our eyes, it's like we're running in and just like doing a soil sample and then trying to base all of our decisions on that. And so Perfect. where I've yeah. kind of swung um, swung back, um, what, kind of one of the, um, I suppose, solutions uh, to this problem is, you know, first is to learn how to use our senses um, and become embodied and be able to gather that information. And it's not esoteric and it's not kind of woo-woo. It's actually, you know, when we study those ways of knowing, they're actually very, very sound. So if we're using, for example, our sense of smell to, get information about a patient, they are now analyzing the aerobiome coming off of people and how that correlates to their skin microbiome and to the chemicals coming off of it. So it's just somebody who's trained their nose to be able to detect that and get useful, which, which is really helpful. There's nothing kind of woo about it, you know? Um, and so the course correction there for not using my, microscopic information to make all of our decisions is you know that I'm kind of increasingly falling in love with herbs, which work at this level, and so herbs with are with with, her, with using herbs, okay, um, with this ecological understanding to me as the antidote to using individual synthetic nutrients <laughs> to try to manipulate these pathways. That if we can see that someone's hot, we can use herbs that help to, the body to get rid of heat, and if we see that someone's damp, which a lot of people are, which is like having biofilms and um, dysbiosis and uh, candida overgrowth, we can use herbs that help clear that, which is just a little bit different than using herbs that are antimicrobial, you know, because those are still looking at that um, reductionist level and, and they're kind of, sometimes they're a mismatch. And so there's a, this kind of added context that's missing, um, missing again. So that's, you know, but I think part of what keeps people moving in this direction is they don't have somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, let's assume that the listener has no familiarity with traditional Chinese medicine and that model of health and these terms that, that you've used a couple of times now of, uh, if someone's hot or cold or damp or summer metabolism versus winter metabolism, mm -hmm begin to understand, uh, begin to explain that to the audience in a way that, that, you know, speaks to them as though they have, they haven't the slightest degree of knowledge on any of that terminology and what any of that means. Well, I, I will, I can do that. But what I want to also point out is that what the beauty of it is, is that they do have an understanding of this. We, this is in, this is innate. Like you, you, you already know what I'm talking about. Not because of any sort of specialized knowledge. You know, this is knowledge that illiterate grandparents, you know, in different cultures have. It doesn't require a degree. It doesn't require PubMed. Children understand this, and so I want to kind of point that out. Um, I want to tie it into what you already know. That you kind of, you know, most people know that if they are hot, their heart's going to be beating faster, even if they're not a doctor or an acupuncturist or a naturopath. It, these are, and so it's really about reclaiming things that are obvious because part of the problem of um, a, a system of medicine that intentionally reduces context, uh, removes context from study is also creates a little bit of a war on common sense and basically says, you think you know this because that's what you see, but actually often what you see isn't true. And so you don't really know better anyways. And that's a fallacy. And we've got like all these Greek and Latin, you know, <laughs> fallacies to, to throw at you. Um, and that's why we're going to do this, this, this randomized study to find out what's really going on. And that's, that's a big mistake. And so if you 
are um, a person at home with mo no medical training, you might want to reclaim things that you already knew to be true and were kind of told that you didn't have any right to know that everything is specialized knowledge. Um, and so, you know, so yeah, so when I say summer metabolism, let's, you know, direct our attention to things that you already know, like in summer, if you go outside, you know, depending on where you are in the world, there's going to be more activity, you know, uh, the plants are going to be out. They're not going to be dormant. There's going to be, um, things kind of move a little bit faster. It tends to be brighter and lighter. Uh, it tends to be warmer, you know, so this is, it's really in many ways, not more complicated than that. You know, now we're back to first principles again. In the winter, it's darker, it's colder, it's stiller, you know, it's more frozen. It's all of these things. And so we can tie this back to, you know, this is kind of our, our birthright. This is what, this is sort of what's going on, whether we're connected with it or not, you know, and whether we, we are aware of it or not. So, so concretize that further and say what, would a person who's more in summer metabolism look like? What kinds of signs or symptoms might they exhibit or personality traits? And, and the same for being in a winter metabolism. And is that Great the same question. as saying hot versus damp? Um, those are really, really great questions. Summer and winter are are kind of more natural timing. So they're, they're happening. Um, if someone's hot, that may or may not be appropriate and damp Again, you know, it, it depends if it's appropriate for the timing. So what so what might you see in summer? Um, in summer, people tend to be more energetic, you know, it, overall. They tend to be more social. Um, they, you know, tend to yeah, move around more and there's more warmth. So and then in winter you get the opposite. So what I was starting to kind of allude to before is that we have this cycling or there is this cycling going on that we're kind of on the, on the ride, <laughs> along for the ride for. So every 24 hours, the sun goes up and the sun goes down, right? So we have um, day and night. And then every year, every trip of the earth makes around the sun, we have, uh, you know, depending on you know, where you are in the world, um, you have summer and winter. So if we look at what can go wrong, when Bob Navio is talking about the cell danger response, and which is uh, a three-step process that any cell goes through if it's um, injured or infected or stressed, what he's found is basically this is like an, um, a bigger amplitude or a bigger summer response, inflammation, right? So you have warmth and then you have fire, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, big, it's big warmth, it's big fire. And so if that goes on for too long, you get damage. And then conversely, we can also get stuck in winter. And this is something I would also you know, love to talk about because people who are stuck in winter are um, the people who tend to get missed by everyone. Um, and so this is, they're not inflamed, they're under inflamed, they're not aging too quickly, they're maybe aging too slowly, you know, and, um, and they will tend to be told by uh, conventional medicine that like, they're really healthy, like their blood pressure is nice and low. You know, their heart rate's nice and low. And meanwhile, you know, they're depressed. They have no memory. They can't poop, you know, and all this stuff. So so th um, this is like the typical maybe uh, chronic fatigue syndrome case. Exactly right. It very well could be. So that's someone who's, um, again, going back to natural principles. Sometimes when we look at first principles, I've found, and I don't know if this is kind of true for you or in general, sometimes it's easier to understand things if I look at an animal versus humans, you know, mm -hmm. like, so um, if a, if a, well, if one thing that happens in nature is that if, um, well, it, well, one thing that happens in nature is that some animals hibernate, you know, and that happens in winter and that's um, a different physiology, you know? Um, and so part of that physiology, things slow down, blood flow to a lot of different parts of the brain slow down. It's, we're not optimized for standing up. Um, so what happens in chronic fatigue? In chronic fatigue, which is like a little bit, you know, people can be different within that umbrella, but a lot of problems happen from like not being able to stand up or sit up. Mm. Why is that? Because the, uh, you know, the platform has gone into hibernation mode, you know, and that's really what's happening. So again, we've zoomed out. We can we start at the chemistry, it's really confusing. And in general, if we start in uh, looking at the microscopic, we're not gonna find the patterns by starting there. We do actually need to start with some understanding. And the fact is that we all do have some understanding. We're just been told we're not allowed to use it when we're studying things, which is maybe a little bit of a mistake. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so um, what else should people understand about summer and winter metabolism? Um, and what, what are the keys to, well, you know what, maybe, maybe we'll go here if, if this might help to add another layer to it. So you've mentioned Dr. Navio's work, the cell danger response. How does that overlay with the idea of summer metabolism and winter metabolism? So I believe, well, I, I was going to say I believe, but he's written it in his paper. Um, so in his, I think it was his first paper on the cell danger response in 2014. It was before he had discovered these three distinct uh, steps with these checkpoints. And what he had discovered was a summer and winter metabolism. So I think that sometimes that gets a little bit left out because it's not highlighted in his newer papers, but it's definitely part of his current understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so the cell danger response, which is based on looking at, you know, how thousands of metabolites move, you know, chore choreographed by the mitochondria, um, it, it's kind of a biochemical rediscovery of summer and winter, hot and cold. We're back to first principles again. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so um, let's say someone is stuck in, let's say someone's prone to being overly hot and being in summer metabolism. Um, what would be good for them? That's a great question. I'm going to, I'm going to reframe this a little bit actually, if okay. that's okay. So one of the places where I feel like, um, you know, cause everyone, there's so many people out there doing such great work, right? Where we need to zoom out is that, um, functional medicine and industrial medicine is pretty much only focused and they are missing all the people stuck in winter. Say, say it one more time. It, 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 functional medicine and industrial medicine are only focused on? So um, functional medicine and industrial medicine are pretty much only focused on excess summer metabolism, inflammation, right? So mm -hmm. they are saying everyone's inflamed. And when we looked at the most common uh, diseases, what you kind of rattled off, um, obesity, cancer, um, you know, all these inflammation, these are all excess summer metabolism. So all of the advice that's being put out there for everyone is really for that group. It's all that kind of anti-inflammatory stuff and, you know, breathe slowly and, you know, de-stress and all of that stuff. And really who I kind of more want to speak to because they're the people who are getting missed are the people who are stuck in winter metabolism because those are the folks who are being told that their blood pressure is nice and low and they're also being told all of your problems are caused by inflammation. So you should be taking curcumin and like whatever, like whatever the kind of general recommendations are. Um, even to the point, actually, I'd, I'd say like there's a lot of uh, researchers out there that are focused on longevity, which is interesting. It's an interesting time to be alive. And I would say that all of the findings for increasing longevity are pushing people away from summer metabolism towards winter metabolism. And to kind of give you an, uh, an interesting example of how that can go maybe a little bit too far, um, recently in Siberia, due to some thawing, they found um, a, a worm, like a nematode, that, that was 42,000 years old that reanimated. Mm. Wow. So that's a 42,000 year old animal that's alive right now. That's winter metabolism, right? That talk about longevity. And so the kind of the blind spot there's an assumption, well, increasing longevity is good. We've discovered that we can increase longevity if we do this. Therefore, everyone should do this, and this is a good thing. But if if you have someone who's watching um, and, their, and their blood pressure is low and they tend to be cold and they're trying to do all these things to help themselves, if they follow that advice, they're likely to feel worse. And it's really hard to find anyone to explain why. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, personal anecdote. I'm wondering if you might have some insight into. Um, when I moved down to Costa Rica several years ago, uh, I started getting this weird thing on my hands where I, I would have little um, little blisters that would come up, particularly between my fingers and, uh, and to some extent on the palms of my hands, um, a bit on my in between my toes as well, nowhere else in my body. And after a while, it's actually something I've had on and off since I was a kid. I remember seeing these little bumps on my fingers when I was a little kid as well. Um, 
And eventually I, I realized that this was something called dishydrotic eczema. And it only really flared up when I, after I moved to Costa Rica. Um, and I spend a lot of time outdoors um, in the sun at, at the beach surfing. Um, and it's hot here, hot, obviously hot tropical sun, uh, playing tennis and doing other activities outdoors um, and working out as well in the gym. Um, and I spent like two years in pursuit of trying to figure out what the hell is causing this thing on my, my hands. And I explored all kinds of things. Maybe it's food intolerance. Maybe I'm allergic to eggs or dairy or something like that. Maybe it's something to do with my gut microbiome. That's what prompted me to do all that gut microbiome testing. Um, I did comprehensive labs of all kinds to figure out if there was something going on in me that could explain this. Um, all the functional medicine doctors I spoke to had no idea what was causing it or how to fix it. Um, and after like years of being frustrated with that avenue and trying to figure out like running so many different experiments, what the hell is causing these symptoms on my hands, these little blisters. Um, I discovered something really interesting, which is that the most eff effective thing for me to do to eliminate it is a cold plunge. And that when I cool my body, particularly when I'm overheated, like after playing tennis for two hours in the hot sun, if I go into a cold plunge, and if I put my hands in the cold plunge, especially if I maybe even do that a couple more times a day for a minute or two, um, and if I air condition my office during the hours I'm in here, as opposed to allowing the hot air from outside in and sort of just being in here and sweating, um, it completely goes away and seems to be a function of literally being too hot in my body, <laughs> that my body starts getting these little blisters in the, in the palms and particularly the, the hot part of my hand. It's also something people who are genetically um, um, prone to uh, sweating a lot through the palms of their hands, which I am, um, are more prone to this condition and being in a hot climate or being in the summer makes you more prone to this condition, also getting it um, in the wet and dry, like going in the ocean and then drying out or going in the pool, which I'm also doing very frequently, those two things. So I have like the perfect storm of factors to um, generate this condition, but I figured out how to completely eliminate it by essentially just cooling my body down for a period of the time and not being overly hot, which is, I think, lines up very much with what you're describing here. A hundred percent. So you're using a, a kind of a first principles based. Um, sometimes the other term I use, which maybe might be a little bit confusing to people, is sort of like physics based. And, but what I mean by that is like at the level of like, you know, humans where we're just like looking at like, you know, up and down and hot and cold, just simple, really, you know, simple. But you've found a, a solution that's based on temperature, which is going to have an effect on your blood flow and on um, kind of the inner systems of your body and how it how it warms and cools itself, and also that the trigger is climate, mm -hmm. which a lot are. Um, you know, there are certain things where you know, not this isn't a panacea, but for some people who are ill, if they kind of move to a different climate, they would be well. And yeah. you know, and it, that's not always possible, and that's not always the case. But also, um, what I want to kind of quickly say as well, though, is that it doesn't follow that everyone's going to benefit from a cold plunge, and that's like you know this. Sure. other layer that I see because there are people out there who basically say that everyone should do it. And going back again to these people who are stuck in winter metabolism, oh boy, they're going to feel worse. And another piece of context is that, um, you know, I love the way that you're using the cold plunge because you're in Costa Rica, you're outside in the hot, <laughs> you know, hot, dem it's likely going to be beneficial for you. And if you look at, for example, um, like Finnish people, they will tend to alternate a cold plunge with a sauna. Yeah. Um, and what I see happening is people who live in temperate climates who I've heard that cold is cold plunges are good mm -hmm. and they are actually, you know, they're doing themselves a lot of harm. You know, it's just physics. It's not personal. Like the cold doesn't care, <laughs> you know, and the hot doesn't care and you're alive and you're in it. Um, and so it's really, yeah, really about being better at asking the questions like, okay, who's this going to be helpful for? And we can run, we can run experiments as well. We can use those questions as a starting point 
for like, is this likely going to be a good direction to go in? And for you, like, yeah, you know, you're super active. You're, you're somewhere hot. You, your condition's worse for heat. There's all sorts of reasons why that's like a good thing for you to try. Mm -hmm. um, whereas for other people, it's like, there's reasons not to try that right now. You know, it, you have to be at a certain level of health to be able to counteract the effects of cold, you know? Yeah. So for some people, um, and then that kind of goes into one of your, I think one of your favorite questions about hormesis, right? That for some people, um, going into a cold plunge, for example, or, you know, exercise or all these other hormetic stressors, but, um, it's going to trigger a response in the body. That's going to increase health, mm -hmm. but for other people, it's going to, you know, decrease integration. It's going to make things worse. And so it's about getting more yet yeah, discerning um, and be, being able to be like, okay, so when is this likely going to be helpful? When should we try this? How do we know if it's working? That's that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think where should we go from here? You know, there's one thing you said that's very an interesting idea, which is you said in passing, um, that some people might be aging too slowly, you know, wherever that there's so much focus on people aging too quickly and how do we slow down aging, but that the, there's a subset of people who are, uh, from your perspective, aging too slowly. What does that mean? Yeah. So <laughs> that, that, you know, without we can, that's a little bit of a jumping off point into, um, looking at something called polyvagal theory, perhaps, you know, so, um, maybe some of your listeners are familiar with it and some of them are not. Um, but just to give a little background, we, most of us tend to think if we think about it at all, the nervous system having kind of a gas and a break, you know, so the sympathetic system would be the gas and that's associated with stress and the parasympathetic nervous system would be associated with the break and that would be calming us down. Um, and so then it follows that a lot of the advice is that what, that we're all too stressed and we're too hot and we just need more break and to calm down. Um, but, but it's a little bit more complex than that. And so there was a researcher or there is a researcher um, named, named Stephen Porges, who's been uh, studying heart rate variability and, and the vagus nerve and, and, and basically the, the nervous system, you know, since the 1960s. And what he found was a little bit of a paradox, which was that, um, if the if if your heart is beating like a you know with a, like a little bit more dynamics to it, then that's a, a sign of health, and it's a sign that your vagus nerve is working a little bit stronger. But when he was doing research in um, the neonatal intensive care unit, I think in the 1970s and 80s, um, as babies became more distressed and were kind of entering more of a danger zone, their heart rate went from very fast to very slow, where there was a danger that it might stop but also that they were able to tell that the, the, the vagal tone was actually increased, not decreased, um, and that the, that kind of variation was increased and not decreased. And so this was a bit of a paradox. And that led him to um, explore and really realize that the vagus nerve has two components to it. And this is also based on evolutionary biology. And I'm not going to kind of dive too deeply into that right now, but it's, it's kind of an important first principles <laughs> part of our understanding. Um, that we have, uh, we have a gas uh, pedal, which is the sympathetic nervous system, but we have two breaks. We have a gentle break and an emergency break. And so the gentle break and connection and relaxation and, and all these good things, but the emergency break um, is you know, triggered based on life threat and, it, and it's related to going into winter metabolism. And that will cause you to age more slowly because you're in a bit of a suspended animation, but it's a, I would say pretty terrible quality of life. You know, it's, you, you can feel dissociated, your body's breaking down. It's really just a last resort. Um, but that would lead someone to age more slowly. That would lead someone to look better on labs because they are exhibiting in many ways, the opposite of what they're looking for, which is all of these, um, inflammatory metabolic diseases. Mm. Fascinating. Um, Mel, I wonder if this might be the best place to leave it for today. I know we have uh, a lot more to explore, um, particularly resting heart rate and heart rate variability, which ties into what you were just talking about with polyvagal theory there. Um, and I suspect probably hours more uh, of content that we could discuss. Um, let's do a part two and we'll reconnect in a few days and pick up where we left off and we'll release these as two podcasts and who knows, maybe a third one will follow. 
Um, but let's keep exploring. I'm, I'm fascinated by your paradigm and your way of looking at human health. So I'd love to keep exploring this with you. Does that sound good? I'd love that. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was a fascinating discussion and I look forward to catching up with you again in a few days. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, and one last thing, Mel, uh, let people know where they can find you if they're interested in working with you, getting in touch with you, your services, products, anything like that. Uh, sure. So um, I'm doing, you know, most of my work where I'm helping people is over at syntheshealth.co. Uh, uh, did I get that right? Syntheshealthlab.co. And um, I have uh, two groups. So one is for people with complex chronic illness. Um, I help people all over the world. It's a fantastic group program. Um, it's, it's really cool. And you can come in for free actually for a little while, hang out, ask me any questions about your health before deciding um, if you want long-term mentorship. And then I have a second group for practitioners. And those are for people who want to learn how to use this in practice, but also there is actually a significant number of practitioners with their own health problems who have struggled to figure out where to go. And so it's really for people um, you know, like me a few years ago to get themselves healthy and learn these first principles and so that they can be a healthier version of themselves and apply what they're learning to their practice. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I'll uh, send you an email and, and we'll figure out the next time to connect for part two. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mel. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.